Uh, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk a little bit about the new wine skin. And uh, over the years, we've been in ministry for 38 years now. And over the years, we've had to make sure that we understand what it is that God's calling us to do uh, in the context of kingdom, in the context of equipping and empowering people, and, uh, and making a difference in the community. Um, and over the years, had to go through change many times. And it's not always easy. When you're young and flexible, it's great. When you're getting a bit older and set in your ways, then you think twice before you bend down to pick up something and change things. Because... Uh, <clears throat> and, 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 and it's so important that, that God is saying to us, I want to do something. And, and the new thing is... Uh, is not a new thing because God says there's nothing new under the sun. Yet what God wants to do has got a freshness of life to it. And we need to discern it correctly. And, but, and so I, uh, I could, I could uh, stand back, it down myself, and reassess it, allow God to recover. We needed recovery, spiritual, mental recovery of the backlash of all the things. Um, and get perspective, and not allow the circumstances of life to overcome you, and realize that the God of then, now, and the future is the same, and when we realign with God, allow Him to revive our hearts, refocus our minds, uh, that it's not dependent on us, it's all dependent on Him, and so we could surrender afresh. Tell you what, it's a big deal to surrender everything again. You know, the words that God's spoken to us over this time is, can you trust me? And you know, when you're 30 years old, you think it's difficult to trust God, but it's actually easy. Because you, I, I know when you're 30, it's difficult. When, you, when you're 30 and you're just married and you got a kid or two, uh, but it's much harder when you're 63. And you've got children and grandchildren and responsibilities and commitments, and you think, and you get to that place where you begin to believe the lie that you're responsible for it all. And you want to live a sensible life and to let it go again, to release it, to give your cares to God and allow God to just be God so that God can do what only God can do. Amen? Can I talk a little bit with you this morning before I preach? And so it was, it's been a very good season for us to do that afresh and, uh, and hear God say, create the future that humanity needs, create the future that reveals the kingdom, make sure that you advance the kingdom, stop trying to build the church, let me build the church, and you advance the kingdom in Jesus' name. And that's what we've heard this morning, and so we celebrate that. Uh, you know, it's not just a new initiative that we're going to celebrate, but many of the others that have been here for years, and God's going to breathe new life and freshness into the school that has been faithful and how Gavin and them have worked it and have brought it to where it is and God's breathing on that and God's breathing on VGY and how that has been adjusted and changed. God is uh, the clinic and I saw the baby clinic and what God's done in and with and still do through the baby clinic, through media in the church. Uh, I wish I could talk about how God is using the media to advance the kingdom. Uh, over the time that we were gone, some songs were written how many of you heard the new songs that is written by the worship team uh, and the role that that's going to play and still will play in, uh, in the kingdom as we advance it? Mentoring men has gone to another level this year because men have stood up and said, we will take that on and give it to us and we'll take a, play a role. Mentoring women has been faithful and God's been using that. So, so there are different things that God has allowed us to make a kingdom impact so that we can touch people's lives who in turn will in touch the the arena that they find themselves in and advance the kingdom of God. And, and that's exciting. Uh, and I want to say this to you this morning. I believe that um, the changes that God has brought uh, and is busy working within our midst has got momentum now. And, and we've got an opportunity to engage in it. Um, let me read you a scripture out of Matthew chapter 2, or rather Mark chapter 2 uh, from verse 13, and I want to just share one or two thoughts with you 
as I invite you, and I feel God invites all of us into the season that we're in, um, of seeing God impacting not just our church or our community, but the world that is so desperate at the moment to see the kingdom come in a brand new way. Jesus went out again beside the sea, Mark 2, 13, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. This Levi is who we know as the disciple called Matthew. Levi. Matthew, and, and he followed him. And as he reclined, that evening Jesus went into his house and he had a meal with Matthew, this tax collector. Other tax collectors and sinners, did you hear that? Jesus is coming into the region. He's about to express kingdom intention He's about to express God's heart to Israel as he walks and comes into his ministry. And, and, and everything that he does contradicts the ways and the order of the day. By the things that he does, the things that he says, and who he gets involved with and the people that he calls. And here's a demonstration of it. He's just healed somebody uh, in a house. He's moving on. And he walks past Levi, the tax collector, which is despised. Tax collectors were despised, especially when you are a Jewish tax collector that was chosen by uh, the leaders of the day, the Roman Empire leaders that says we need people that sit at the trading routes. And when people do business, make sure, because Israel was heavily taxed by the Roman Empire, for, for business and for who they were, and they had to pay taxes. And so when you make yourself available to collect taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire, they were despised and disliked by their own people. So Matthew was not famous. He was not a well-loved. He was wealthy from what he took from his own people and being paid by another empire. And so they were despised. So Jesus comes in and he calls this young man and says, I want you to follow me. And the people didn't like that the Pharisees, the scribes, the leaders of that day, the religious people of the day didn't like the fact that he called these people. And then the Bible says he didn't just call him. He, he says to him, I want to have a meal with you. And he goes into his house. And as they go into the house, many other tax collectors people that are disliked, despised by others, and sinners, the Bible says, were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. I wonder whether we're ready for the kind of people that God would like to bring into the kingdom of God and into our midst. <laughs> can I just talk to you a little bit this morning, not preach so much? Can, can, can we... As we are allowing God to, we've come out of COVID, we've come out of change, and, and, we, and, and I know there's lots to, to, to happen, and there's lots of struggles and challenges in the life, but God is saying, I want to turn you, now that you have rec I've recovered and restored, and I'm still recovering and restoring, are you prepared to turn me to you towards those that are in greater need and have got no understanding and insight that you have, and allow them to come into your midst so that you can share blessed assurance with them? And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw, when they saw this, that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well need no physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples, and so they're carrying on, John's disciples and the Pharisees we're fasting. So Jesus is feasting and they fasting. Did you, get that? Did you get that? Somehow Jesus just cuts across everything. You know, one of the things that I felt that God said to me 
over this time, and I'm just going to drop things as they come to my mind this morning, is God said to me, I want you to know that I came so that you may have life and have it in abundance. I'm here to bless you, and I'm here to lead and guide you, but I will cross you. I would like an amen on that one. God says, I, I, I'm not here just so that you can be comfortable and be blessed. I'm also here so that you can adjust and realign with who I call you to be and what I've called you for so that you will not just be blessed by me, but that I call you so that you can advance my kingdom. And for that, I will cross you. I will say things unashamedly, unapologetically that might be uncomfortable, but will be life-giving if you would yield to it. Amen. Anyway, I'm just reading that. So now, John's disciples, John was of a specific order. John was the one that pre-announced Jesus. It's coming, that he's about to, this is the son of God. This is the one we're looking for, this Jesus. John is preaching a radical message. The Bible says, before him and after him, there will be nobody like John the Baptist in his greatness, in the way that he proclaimed and he preached a radical message. He would say, you bunch of vipers and whitewashed sepulchers, you should turn, repent. And he would call people to true repentance. And Jesus is coming. So John has had a following of people, radicals. You know, the wild one that eats uh, uh, honey and, and, and grasshoppers and uh, locusts or rather. And, uh, and he, he's the one that proclaims a radical, challenging everybody. And Jesus is coming in, so he's got a group of people following him, John the, the, uh, and his disciples, and the Pharisees, the, the ones that the scribes and the Pharisees that would articulate very accurately, very specifically, the laws of God and encourage people how to keep it in a very specific, legalistic way. The, the, these are the people that are now fo following a certain uh, set of rules and uh, uh, programs and uh, ways of how they need to do kingdom, and, and part of their law says to them, they used to fast twice a week, and they're fasting now, and Jesus is coming through with his disciples, and they're feasting. And so they've got a problem, and the people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your, your disciples don't fast? It, it was not just about the fasting that they questioned Jesus about. It was about the fact that Jesus would come into their midst with a whole group of new disciples that would dare to do things differently. And they wanted to know who gave him the authority to change things. The way that they used to do things, the way that they know sh things should be done, who is this Jesus that now comes into their midst and change things. Dare to tell the disciples they don't have to fast, they can feast. Who is this disciple? Who is this Jesus that comes in and bring people into the circle that are seen by them and treated by them as unclean and, and people that you shouldn't hang with? Who, who's this Jesus that's doing this? And Jesus answers them and he said, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, can they, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in the day, in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new form the, from the old and, the, and worse, the te, worse, a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into an old wine skin. And if he does, the wine will burst the wine skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh or new wine skins. Jesus is speaking, and I don't want to particularly speak about the cloth, old cloth and the new cloth. It's the same meaning. God's speaking about an era where there was a robe of uh, a, priest, uh, a priestly robe of the law that was represented that's replaced with a new go uh, 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 garment, a garment of righteousness. And he's talking about that. But Jesus is saying, and so they are questioning Jesus about what he's doing and what he's about to do and that he's not doing it the way they think he should do it. Just bear with me for a while. And Jesus is addressing this and he's telling them this story. He says, I'm going to do things that looks different, sounds different, and will be different 
but it doesn't mean that it's wrong. And if you don't understand what I'm doing and what era we're in and what order I'm bringing, you might miss the whole thing. And he ends up sharing with them the principle of new wine and old wine. And, and this is used often. You know, people use this loosely. They use this to judge and condemn. They use this to disconnect themselves. But Jesus wants us to get something fresh out of this this morning. And God's got something fresh for us right here at Victory in the context when he says, uh, and Martinez comes up here and the team shares and, and we've seen the changes and say, God's doing something fresh and new. What Jesus did not say, he did not say, out with the old and in with the new. Yeah. Oh, can I say that one more time? He didn't say, out with the old and in with the new. He said, I'm going to release new wine. I want to release new wine. And in those days, they didn't put wine in bottles. They put it in a wine skin that was made out of goat skin. And they would put something together. And because it's fresh and new, it had the ability to stretch. Because as the, they put the wine in and it fermented, it, it released gases that would stretch that wine skin so that it will be able to take the process, handle the process, and preserve the wine. And Jesus is saying, when a wine skin gets old, it's old when it's got no wine in it. It's old when it's not been used and it gets hot and brittle. And if you then put new wine in that wine skin, he says it's got the, because it's hot and hasn't been stretched and used, it's got the possibility of bursting the wine skin. And then what happens is you lose the wine skin and you lose the wine. I'm, sh I'm sharing something very important here this morning. Jesus is not saying out with the old and in with the new. He says, I want to do something new. Now listen carefully. And he's not talking to you and me about the wine because the wine is not your responsibility. The wine is not the issue. The new wine is not the issue. Jesus is the maker of the new wine, and he releases the new wine. He's talking about how we make ourselves available to make sure that we don't lose the new wine. And this new wine that he's bringing does not burst the old wine skins, and we lose both the wine and the wine skin. So he's talking about that. He's talking about, he says, be careful. He says, because new wine, this new wine, this new thing that I'm doing, this new covenant that I'm bringing in, this, this new thing that I'm establishing that is not based on the law of the day. It's not based on circumstances. Um, I mean, systems and structures and programs. It's based on my spirit moving in and amongst you and releasing the life of God in a brand new way. He says, you're going to have to make sure that you facilitate and handle that very carefully. I, I want you to know this morning, as I've, as I've sat down and listened carefully again, I need to realize, I, and this is, this is nothing new, it's just realizations, truths that I had to revisit again when God said to me, son, Jesus is not a Bible study. Christianity is it's not a meeting. The kingdom is not a program. I, I said to the people the other day, they said they want to get involved in the kingdom, in kingdom programs. I said the kingdom is not a program. The, the kingdom is the very life of God being released amongst people. The kingdom comes when, when you know that people are living life the way God intended life to be lived. When God releases His perspective, His, His understanding in our hearts of how to live life, how, how to, to be a father or how to be a husband or a, a mother or a, or, or a businessman, when you are involved in, in sports, and you know what God intended you to do in sport or in music or in business, where, where what comes through you is not just a, 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 just a mere duty or a commitment and an obligation, but, but it releases life in you because what you do is a service unto others and brings pleasure and joy unto God. And with it is a value system and a culture that you carry that brings with, with it, something about who God is wherever you are. Can, can I say that again? 
Kingdom is, is not a program. It's, it's not something that we do. I said to somebody, I am not your program. People that are rest privileged and, and people that are struggling, is not, they're not a program. They're people that God loves and cares for and gave his very life for. And God wants us to make ourselves available as he moves in and amongst the community. He wants to release new wine. New wine is the very life of the Spirit, the very energy of God into them, the, the caring heart of God. God says, I want to I move in the community, and I want to have wineskins, people that hold that life, and people that carry that God kind of life in such a way that you will bring to them not a system, not a program, not a project that you'll bring them the very life of God while you are who you are, whether you're a teacher, a businessman, an a architect, a doctor, a t whatever it is, whether you're a preacher, whatever it is, that you bring the very life of God that brings them hope for themselves, that God loves them and cares about them, and that God wants to release His life to them and give them a purpose and a destiny. But the minute that we think that the kingdom is a program, we miss it. And like Martina said, this is not a once-off meeting. This is God wanting to do something that will carry on, not just in this lifetime of mine, but for generations upon generations, because somehow somebody sees the importance of what they have received from God, the value of redistributing, sharing, and making that available to others. Jesus is sharing that with them. Kingdom is... It's us bringing the righteousness of God, not our own righteousness. The kingdom of God is us serving with love and care so that others may touch the goodness and the kindness of God. Jesus is speaking to them. He says, listen, be very careful. He says, I want to do, I'm flowing, I'm moving. The spirit of God. That's why whenever you hear Jesus speaks about the kingdom, he says the kingdom of God is like. Can you remember the parables that he said? And then he says the one time it's like a farmer. Then it's like somebody doing this. Then it, The kingdom can't be confined in one description. The kingdom is the spirit of God moving freely where he wants to move, as he wants to move through people in many different ways so that others may experience the life, the governance, and the rule of God that will give them a favorable outcome. And Jesus is saying, he says, listen, I'm moving I'm moving. He says, I want you to be ready for the new wine. It's important, you know, even as I was sitting over this time, I realized what is now old. I remember one day somebody came to me and said to me, you're an old wineskin. I had to pray in tongues <laughs> for five minutes. I was thinking of laying hands on him without <laughs> prayer. But, but as I was listening to him, the Holy Spirit said to me, you might look like an old wineskin to him. But where he finds himself, he's an old wineskin to the next generation. Of course, an old wineskin has got nothing to do with a human being and with a person or with age. It's got to do with a mindset that is flexible to fl fu fu function and flow with the Holy Spirit as to what He wants to do, where we don't begin to say that if God wants to move, then He needs to move this way and only this way because that's the way we've done it and that's the way we will do it. A new wineskin is people that understand that the new wine is grace and the Holy Spirit moving amongst these people and we are flexible and open to see the change happening without getting legalistic and stop what God wants to do. So Jesus is speaking to these men and women around him. He says, listen, I'm going to do a new thing. And, and, and it's going to look sometimes the same than what you used to, but other times it's going to look totally different. And don't be confused that what you think should happen in a way that you think it should happen stop you from being a carrier of this new wine. 
Jesus says, this new wine must be put into new wineskins. It must be put in, in, into the hands and into the hearts of people that are willing to do whatever God's telling them to do in a different way, and sometimes in the same way, but out of their heart of conviction, not out of legalism and religion. I realized over this time that God is so releasing new wine in people's hearts. God is saying to people, we can't change the world. We can't change our families. We can't change our businesses. We need a fresh flow of God's insight and understanding and God's life to come into us and flow through us. And I realize the way that God's going to advance his kingdom is going to take different people in different arenas of life. You know, I just want to mention this to you quickly and then close with, with an important thing. When you look at the Old Testament and you look at the story of God bringing his people out of exile, when he brings them out of Egypt, or uh, they, not Egypt, out of exile when they were in Babylon, and God is saying to his people, I'm going to bring you back, and you begin to read the stories of the so-called minor prophets, um, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, the people that play a role. To be honest, right through the Bible, the stories of God bringing his people out of something where they got stuck into something new took different people that had an understanding of what God wanted to do so that he could bring them into the fullness of what he had for them and demonstrate his goodness and his kindness to, his, to the people around them. You know, Joseph is one of those stories. I, I want to, in the days to come, talk to you about Joseph and Daniel. These were not pastors and prophets and apostles. They were just businessmen. They were just, they were just people that God used in the capacity of their willingness, availability, and their skill to change the destiny of a nation. They were not pastors. When you look at the story of, of Ezra, so, so I want to say this to you this morning. It's going to take all of us together to allow God to do something fresh in our hearts and carry the kingdom message with flexibility and humility together so that God can infiltrate every part of society and bring his rule and his reign, but more than that, to bring his God kind of life into our community through all of us. When you read the story about Ezra, uh, Ezra, when, he, when the people come out of exile, the, Ezra is a teacher of the Word of God, and he's a teacher of spiritual values and culture. He teaches the people, they rebuild the temple. If you go and read the book of Ezra, they're rebuilding the temple, and God comes and meets them supernaturally, shows them favor, and he establishes within the people's hearts the value of the Word of God, kingdom values, and kingdom culture. I want to say to you this morning that we cannot advance the kingdom of God unless we gather together to sit under the word, to learn about kingdom values and kingdom culture and worship God together so that we know we're, we're together for a specific purpose. That's why the kingdom is the rule, the governance, and the reigning of God in our hearts so that we can release a God kind of life, not just any life. And so, and so Ezra establishes a spiritual value system, spiritual principles, and a culture amongst the people. Then you move on to the next book, and you read the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is an urban developer. He works in the king's courts, and he gets this burden that, that we have got a new spiritual value system, and we've been redeemed by God, and we believe in God, and we've got a, a Godly kingdom culture, but, but, but we want to move out from where we are into our own space and our own cities and, and create a safe place for ourselves. And God gets, gives Nehemiah the instruction to rebuild the city and the city walls. Takes marketplace ministers, people that understand the marketplace and the importance of established um, opportunity and rebuild society and create working opportunities so that people have a value and a worth and a sense of security as they express their gifts and their talents. And God uh, raises up Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is not a pastor and he's not a preacher. Nehemiah is a rebuilder of a city and a city wall. Some of you sitting here and, and God gives you ideas to start businesses and uh, new developments and new initiatives. And it's the, to the benefit of those around you. Those are kingdom advances. 
Those are not just people who just casually work because they've got a degree or a skill or an ability in an area. Those are people that uplift. Have you ever seen people when you hear somebody says there's a new development coming, everybody gets excited. They don't know what they get excited with and for. They, they're not going to benefit from it directly, but they get excited because it means development and growth and work opportunity and, 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 and finances coming in. And Do you understand that? And Nehemiah is a rebuilder of the wall, and he gives people an opportunity to work and stand up for and build something of confidence and security where they could live in. And then you go to the next book, and it's the book of Esther. And Esther is this innocent, beautiful little girl that's not too bold and doesn't want to do too much. But God calls her to stand up for social justice. And, and Vasti, the previous queen, of the king speaks out. And when the king calls her and wants to brag with her because of her beauty and who she is, and, and, uh, and she gets sidelined by the king and, uh, 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 and, and, she, and she takes, uh, he takes her authority away from her and her role and her function as queen away, and he gives it now to somebody new, and he gives it to Esther. And Esther doesn't want to reveal who she is and that she's a Jew, and she doesn't want to stand up against the king, but her uncle calls for her to stand up and says, listen, there's somebody, a guy called uh, Haman that wants to destroy the nation and all the Jews, and I'm calling you to stand up for us and stand up for social justice and righteousness and say something to the king. And she says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm just a, and she's a beauty queen. She lives in the palace. She's safe. And her uncle lets her know and says, listen, you might live in the palace and you might be blessed, but you can't use the blessing of the Lord just to feather your own nest and do your own thing. You, you are here for a greater purpose than just being blessed yourself. You're here to stand up for God's purposes and allow Him to bring social justice and establish His righteous purposes in a nation. And we know the story about Esther. And Esther stands up, and you know, in this book of Esther, God's not once mentioned. But God still calls them to fulfill the kingdom purpose. And Esther stands up, and she says this. She says, of course, her uncle Mordecai lets her know, and he says to her, listen, if you say nothing, you will be found out anyway some other time that you're also one of us. And they'll kill you even if you don't say anything. But if, you kill, if they kill you because you say something, at least they kill you for a reason. And Esther says this, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And if I perish, I perish. But who knows, maybe I'm called for such a time as this. And you know what? This new thing that God's doing is not a new thing in the sense of something that has never happened before. The challenge is, if we are not aware of the fact that God is stirring something new in your heart that takes you beyond just a religious lifestyle to spiritual renewal like Ezra brought to the nation. If you don't understand that God is stirring something in you that you are not just working in the marketplace because you've got a degree and a qualification and a business, but God's stirring you to build something for the benefit of the people in the nation, not just something that you will benefit from. That, that you will understand that you are blessed and you are favored by God and that you're in a position where you're enjoying the, the palace, but it's not just so that you can enjoy the palace, but that you need to step up and get out of your comfort zone to say, if I perish, I perish, and if I lose, I lose, but I'm going to do something for the benefit of others. And God pours out his wine amongst us, and you don't realize what he's doing. It might burst you. It might offend you just like it did John the Baptist, just like John the Baptist who once was new wine and a new strategy of God who now became an old strategy and a different strategy. And God says, I want you to listen to what I'm doing and I want you to engage with me and allow me to touch you spiritually, engage with you in your physical realm where you function and get you involved socially where I want you to lift and empower. If you don't do that, I might have to sideline you because the Spirit of God is going to move and keep on moving and advance the kingdom of God with or without you. And John the Baptist learned that in a very painful and a difficult way because he lost his head. 
when he said to the disciples of Jesus, just, just ask him this, is he really the one that we're looking for or shall we look for one, someone else? And you know, over the years, many times, uh, <laughs> I've said this to you earlier on, over the th last 38 years, I've been at this point many times where God said to me, I want you to get out of the way and release it to somebody else because you must pour the new wine into new wine skins. But my heart is not to burst you. My heart is that you will reposition yourself. So when a wine skin got older and brittle and dry, the way that they would revive that wine skin is they would dunk it in water. When it's hot and brittle, they would put it in water and soften it. And then when they've softened it, leave it, and then pour oil on it and begin to rub it with oil. And then it'll become soft and pliable and tender so that they could put wine in the wine skin again. Did you get that? Jesus is saying, he says, listen, there's a move. And you can't pin it down to one thing. The kingdom of God is not just like one thing. The kingdom of God is like this, and it's like a farmer. It's like sowing. It's like a tree that gives shade to all the birds. And Jesus says, he says, my spirit is moving, and it's moving like the wind. And wherever it moves, you can't determine where it'll move and how it'll move. He says, but what you need to make sure is that you're the one that is willing to set your sails according to the Spirit of God so that as I move and how I move, you become a carrier of the new wine and of that glory and not one that resists it and then it bursts you and we lose you and the old wine. Jesus is saying it's going to take all of you. It's going to take a spiritual dimension like Ezra to establish spiritual values, spiritual principle, spiritual truths in your heart. It's going to take people with new initiatives and, and, and new visions and new ideas. There, there are people sitting here and you've come to your end, but God wants to give you a brand new idea for a new business and a new startup and a, and a new thing and a new initiative that will not, listen, not just bless and enrich you, but will make a, create an opportunity for other people around you. There are people that are super blessed today and you live in your comfort and, and God is calling you like he does in Esther and say, listen, don't just sit there and enjoy the benefit of your blessing. It's for more than you. And don't end up in a place where that which I do offends you and robs you from being a carrier of the news. Now, now just in closure, it's not really about the new wine. Because Jesus says, I'm pouring out new wine. I'm doing something fresh. It's, it's about the wine skin. And Jesus says, and if you're in a place where it's not working for you and you feel dry and, and, and brittle and, and empty, he says, then won't you come to me? Because listen carefully, Jesus is the winemaker. Did you remember that? It's him. It's Jesus that, that showed up at the feast and they ran out of wine that he said to them, go and fill the water pots with water. And then he turned the water into wine. C can I share that with you this morning? There's somebody sitting here, just like I found myself a few months ago into a place of tiredness and uh, worn out and, and discouraged and despondent in, in many ways, and thinking, God, how do we go forward? And he said to me, just come aside and fill the water pot with water, and I'll turn it into wine. Don't try and work out how you're going to change everything, lead everything, encourage everybody, be an answer to everybody. J just make sure that you fill yourself with the water of my word, and, and then I will turn the water into wine. That, that's not all. It's not just about him being the wine maker. It's also that Jesus is the wine press. There was a time in Matthew where Jesus, just before he got crucified and poured out his life, for us, that he went to, into Gethsemane, and the word Gethsemane means oil press. And, uh, and I want to say to you this morning, listen carefully, I'm closing with this. If we need to do what Ezra has done, Nehemiah has done, or Esther has done, or if we have to do what Martinez has done, or many others of you are already doing, there's many other people sitting here doing kingdom exploits. If you do that, 
and you haven't had a touch, a, 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 a touch from Jesus' hand rubbing oil into your life and anointing you for this thing, you won't make it. You'll end up in a place where you say, I've given money, I've given of myself, I've given time, I've served people, and they have thrown it back into my face. They, they, I, I've done that before. People don't appreciate it. They don't deserve it. Look at what they've done. You will get despondent and discouraged because you see it as a project or an event. It is, it is only when you get touched by the grace of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you can say like Esther says, if I perish, I perish. It's only then when you can stand up like Daniel and his friends and say, if we burn, we'll burn, but we won't bow. It's only when you've got the grace and the anointing of God on your life that you can sit in a pit and say, I'm still dreaming the dream like Joseph that even if your own brothers put you in the pit and sell you cheap and say, I'm not going to give up and give in, you need more than just self-centered ambition. You need more, listen carefully, you need more than guilt and condemnation to stand up there to this morning and say, I'm going to go for this. After you heard Teach Smith say at 70, this is what I'm doing. What are you doing? Your little bit for Jesus. <laughs> to say, I'm not going to do this because I'm guilty. I'm going to do this because Jesus gave his life for me. Gave his very best. Keep on giving his best when I deny him, when I'm unfaithful, when I'm disloyal, when I'm not committed, when I'm not giving, when I'm self-centered and selfish. Whatever my motive is, he's never stopped giving to me, loving me, encouraging me, and believing in me. And when I see that, something else, inspiration gets hold of my heart. And I want to say to you this morning, and I want to read you the very last scripture in Matthew chapter 13. Listen carefully. Matthew 13 verse 52. And Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained, every scribe, somebody that is knowledgeable and full of understanding concerning the things of God and the ways of God, anybody that has been trained in the kingdom of heaven, that understand it's much more than religion, a meeting, a program, or an event. Anybody that's trained in this kingdom where God says, let my kingdom come, my way of doing life, my kind of life for you, whatever it is that you do. Anybody that's trained in, this, in the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and old. Jesus says it's not out with the old and in with the new. He says it's something new that I'm bringing to new and old people together so that you become carriers of something that's fresh, life-giving, and kingdom advancing. And I want to do it through you. It's got a spiritual dimension. It's got a marketplace dimension. It's got a social dimension. And I'm inviting you. I'm challenging you that you can't just use God. You see, some people want to just do the spiritual thing. They want to have a Bible study and worship and be blessed and get touched by God and same old thing over and over. And God's not. He says, no, I establish a value system, a culture, and a way of life so that you can move out and rebuild the city. But you can't just rebuild the city so that you accomplish great works. You also need to go out there and touch people in their distress and their hardship and bring social justice and, and righteousness. And I'm inviting you into it. And God's coming and this morning he says, I don't want to offend you and burst you, but I want you to adjust yourself so that we don't lose this new thing and we lose you. And so when I went away, I had to allow God to realign me in my heart, in my mind, and in this old wineskin. And said to me, fill me with your water. Give me perspective and insight and revelation. And Father, where I'm stiff and, and, and not pliable and not flexible, work your oil in me and show me the truth of your word and allow me to repent. That I got legalistic and set in my ways and and don't want to be disturbed in my comfort zones. My heart belongs to you. My life belongs to you. I belong to you. Have your way in me, Jesus. And, and then say, and I'm a bit scared. 
And he says to me, it's okay, but if you trust me, I'll take you places where you've not been before. I'll make you a carrier at this end time with some new wine. Isn't that exciting? And God is saying this to you and me in this church this morning. He says, I want to preserve old and new. And as God's doing new things through new people, He's also going to do exciting things to some of the older people because they're flexible and full of anointing. And if that's you this morning, I want you to stand with me this morning. Then I want you to say, God, I'm not doing this because of selfishness. I'm not doing this out of guilt. I'm doing this because I want you to inspire me through your spirit because Jesus did that for me. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning. Just, just close your eyes for a moment. God speaking to people here this morning. God speaking to people here this morning. There are some amazing men and women standing here and God's inviting you in the kingdom. And the king to a kingdom journey. Right there where you are. In the arena, on the platform, where he's given you influence. If I had time, I could share with you all the people that God used. None of them were perfect. To be honest, some of them did it in a weird way and some of them did it in a very non-religious way and, and some of, somehow in a scary way, but God used them anyway to advance his kingdom. It's his righteousness, not yours. So Father, this morning, just for a moment, we want to quiet our hearts and make ourselves available for you to pour the new wine. We want to make ourselves available to, to do with, in and through us, whatever you want to and establish certain values in our hearts and mobilize us to, to do whatever it is that you want us to do and see the change happening in our community. And we will not forget to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. God will show you what to do. He's able to show you. If you listen and you wait, He will show you. He will give you an, an idea. It might be a small beginning, but He'll show you. If he doesn't show you, there are people around you that are busy with things and he will make you aware of it so that you can co-labor. And if you're not sure at all, then there's somebody either the connect group or somewhere in the leadership or somewhere a mature Christian that, that might guide you on how to get involved and how to engage in, in advancing the kingdom of God from right here where we are as a spiritual house out there in the business world where people are working hard and establishing new things or where people are touching the very felt need of people that are helpless and discouraged and despondent and that's why Jesus says and if you give somebody a glass of water in my name if you do it really not out of guilt and obligation but because I told you to take somebody a sandwich it's worth everything because it's me. It's advancing the kingdom because it's not a program. It's, it's obedience to the very spirit of God in your life. And he might take that and turn it into a business or into a, whatever he wants to. He might just be you taking a sandwich every week, but it's you obeying his voice. Father, I thank you this morning. For new wine, you lift your hands and say, Father, I received the new wine. Do with me whatever you want to, do with me what you pleased, as you please. I receive the new wine in Jesus' name. God bless you.